I'm out here in what was formerly Comanche territory. And as you can recall from M. Scott Mama Day's text, uh, Comanches and the Kiowas were actually allies. So I came out here because it's more fun talking to you guys out here than it is talking in a classroom or talking in my house or whatever. We got Roxy back there sniffing in the snow. Um, but anyways, so I want to talk about a couple of things in the way to Rainy Mountain. Um, so if you have your text, and if you want to follow along, please go ahead. Um, just a few sections. Um, I'm not going to give you the page number, I'm going to give you the section number, because my copy of Rainy Mountain is very, very old. So I'm kind of thinking that the page numbers might not match up. But if you look at section 12 in the text, it starts off by saying, an old there was who lived with his wife and child. One night the woman was pounding meat and her little son wanted to taste it. She gave him a ball of meat and he went outside to eat it. Then he returned and wanted more. She gave him another ball of meat and he went again outside. A third time he came and asked for meat. The old man began to be afraid. He told his wife to give the child a large ball of meat and to act as if these things were all right. When the little boy came in again, there was an enemy with him. The enemy said, there are many of us and we are all around. We came to kill you, but your son has given me food. If you will feed us all, we will not harm you. But the old man did not believe his enemy. And while his wife cooked fat upon the fire, he crept out and led their horses upstream. When he was well away, he called out in the voice of a bird. Then the woman knew that it was time to go. She set fire to the fat and threw it all around upon the enemies who were sitting there. Then she took up the little boy in her arms and ran upstream. That is how the old man and the woman and their child got away. From a safe distance, they could see the fire and hear the screams of their enemies. So this particular um, text doesn't necessarily have to do with the story of the return of Mama Day to his grandmother's house, um, but it's an example of what he's doing with this text. Um, what he's trying to do is he's trying to sort of also show um, some of the ideologies of his people, some of the proverbs, some of the stories, um, some of the beliefs of his people, and this is one of them. And this one kind of reads like a proverb in a way. Um, it's a story from which a lesson can be taken. Uh, the lesson being, don't trust your enemies. Um, and it also showed a very clever way uh, in which he wasn't to trust his enemies. Um, let's look again. Let's look at another one. Let's look at, let's see. I'm looking here. Oh, there's so much good stuff in this text. Let's look at, let's look at um, number 20. Number 20. Starts off, it's a, it's a shorter one. It says, once there was a man who owned a fine hunting horse. It was black and fast and afraid of nothing. When it turned upon an enemy, it charged in a straight line and struck at full speed. The man need have no hand upon the rein. But you know, that man knew fear. Once during a charge, he turned that animal from its course. That was a bad thing. The hunting horse died of shame. So what's that one saying? What's that sort of proverb story saying? Uh, the horse had no fear, but the man had fear. So the horse was charging in, and in the man's fear, he turned the horse aside. Um, and because of that, the horse died. Um, and not only did he die, he died of shame. And we could also kind of wonder if perhaps maybe the man died as well. That perhaps he should have trusted his horse. And as you've learned from this reading, the Kiowa were a horse people. Uh, they relied heavily upon their horses. So what this particular proverb is saying is trust your horse. Um, I learned that, well, it wasn't a horse that I learned it. I learned it on a burro <laughs> um, going down into the Grand Canyon one time. The guide told us all, he's like, no matter what, just trust your burro. You know, when you're going down into the canyon and you're looking a thousand feet down, it's a pretty scary thing. But you do have to rely on your animal um, because its footing is sure. It knows what it's doing. Um, it is, oh gosh, it's right about in the middle of the text. Um, it's right around section, right, right after section seven. But this is really important and I really want to leave 
leave you guys with this one. I want you to really think about what it says. Um, and I want you to think about it in particular, uh, what it means in terms of autobiography. Uh, your first paper is going to have to do with the autobiography of people, um, of particular, of particularly the Native Americans, um, and why it's so important that stories be told. But let's look at what this one says. It says, a word has power in and of itself. It comes from nothing into sound and meaning. It gives origin to all things. By means of words can a man deal with the world on equal terms. And the word is sacred. A man's name is his own. He can keep it or give it away as he likes. Until recent times, the Kiowas would not speak the name of a dead man. To do so would have been disrespectful and dishonest. The dead take their names with them when out of the world. Now, this in another way is also kind of like a proverb, uh, but also kind of like a lesson. Um, in Western culture, we're used to the idea of you know, you want your name to live on, you want people to speak of you when you're gone, um, but the Kiowa didn't, which also plays into another interesting thought of, you know, this idea of gossip, where, you know, you don't want people to talk about you behind your back, and so that's sort of what that takes into account, that, you know, the dead maybe didn't want themselves to be talked about uh, behind their back, but more than that, it says in here, a man's name is his own, he can keep it away, or he can keep it or give it away as he likes. So what that's saying in essence is that it's up to the individual in terms of autobiography. We tell our stories, we tell stories of what happens to us because we want others to know of our experiences. We want others to know who we were or how we are, how we react to situations, you know, what we face in life, how we overcome obstacles. And that is up to each individual to give away Uh, M. Scott Mama Days, uh, The Way to Rainy Mountain, as much as I did, and 